the mules are in the corral. Welcome to Mule Talk, and I'm Cindy K. Roberts, your host. In today's episode, we will be talking with world-renowned mule trainer, author, and TV personality, Meredith Hodges of the Lucky Three Ranch in Loveland, Colorado. Welcome back, Meredith. Well, glad to be back, Cindy. It's always fun to talk to you. I'm very excited about today's episode because we're going to be talking about correct saddle placement and related issues. So share with us what you have found out to work. Well, I can honestly say that what we are fed in the beginning when we first get into equines is confusing enough as it is. But I do remember when I was first uh, getting into equines, I thought that I had to have a different saddle for everything I was doing. Even if it was all Western stuff, I still had to have a stock saddle, an equitation saddle. uh, And then uh, in combined training and and dressage, I had to have a dressage saddle and and a jumping saddle and... uh, I thought, you know, this could get really expensive. Right. And, you know, and but that's what they make you think. And through my research and everything, my mules taught me that in order to make an educated decision about what tack and equipment to use, you need to take into account the anatomy of the equine and the effect it have as, has on his body movement during certain activities. Good confirmation is important in allowing the equine to perform to the best of his ability, but so is developing core strength elements like the muscles, ligaments, tendons, soft tissue, and cartilage such that the skeleton is ideally symmetrically supported. The equine's body can then move freely and using his joints properly in good posture. This adds to his longevity of his youth life and will minimize arthritis and other problems during his life. And lower vet bills are always a, a bonus. So what that says, basically, is no, you don't need a different saddle for everything. Oh, what you yeah. need is, is, is a saddle that fits and that you can ride in on all these different activities that you might be doing. And as versatile as mules are, boy, you could end up with a whole lot of different saddles if you didn't just pay attention to, you know, the development of his core strength in a postural balance. And when you do, then I have been working with basically the same saddles that I I purchased in the first 10 years, uh, my circle Y saddles, my longhorn saddles, and and my Passier and Corbett saddles, all purpose saddles, so I could use the English saddles in dressage, or I could use them in jumping. The Western saddles, I just paid attention to the balance of the saddles and okay. the way they were made. Yeah. And did they sit right on the back of the animal? Did they put me, were the stirrups set right so that they put me in a postural balance so I could ride? And, of course, you have to take into consideration the way you feed your animal. And I've been testing feeding on over 100 animals. Here in Colorado, I finally scaled down. I was working on my mom's ranch with 100 head of of equines. And we fed them basically the same way as I do mine in Colorado, uh, with grass, hay, oats, corn oil, show glow, and that sort of thing. You can look that up on my website. Um, But the reason that I feed the way that I do is because I tested other feeds on all these animals over 50 years, both at my mom's ranch and at my ranch in Colorado. And what I discovered is that all the good stuff they say about all these feeds, they say because they've been testing them in laboratories. They don't <laughs> they they give them to us, and then we're the guinea pigs out here that, that field test these things. Right. And then we run into colic and allergies and founder and all these things, but how many of us actually think it's the feed that's doing it when they're promoting and marketing these feeds as being great, and we see... You know, our animals get getting a nice fatty looking body and everything. But I I asked myself, I said, well, is that really healthy? Right. Uh, You know, because what I attend to with the feed that I'm using now is the actual core uh, 
elements, like I mentioned, that are supporting the skeleton. And what you see from these other feeds are a nice, hearty, fatty-looking animal uh, that may have nothing supporting, you know, the skeleton or anything like that. And if you doubt what I'm saying, just look at what our general human population has done. You know, when, when, when Dwight Eisenhower and Kennedy started the uh, physical, you know, government programs where you do the, the, the jumping jacks and the sit-ups and all of that, our population was really pretty thin and live and live and we were able to move around and we were healthy people. But you look around now, what you see is a whole bunch of the people that look like the fatty animals. Right. And I yeah. have to ask myself, how healthy is that? Right. You know? So uh, the show glow vitamins are just like the one-a-day vitamins that were developed way back when. You know, we didn't have all these supplements. And if you're going to use supplements, you need a baseline. You can't just start feeding supplements because you think you need it. You right, need to take right. a, a laboratory baseline. Get a blood test. See what, if it's lacking. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, if I get this baseline and it comes back and it says my animal is anemic, is that really true? Because they don't, they don't have a lot of data on donkeys and mules anyway. Right. And so most of mine have come back anemic, and so I went ahead and put them on red cell and made no difference at all. They, they were anemic, they had energy, they won all their classes. <laughs> <laughs> and they, as they got older, they got a little slow, but who doesn't? <laughs> oh, that's good. You know, so, and then they come up with all these things they want you to buy and, and everything, and they've managed to mix up salt blocks and salt and minerals and everything, like we got to feed those like supplements too. But in my experience, you put a trace mineral salt block in every pen where your animals are going to be, and they'll head for it when they need it because their instincts tell them what they need. Right. So I, t I try to leave that choice up to them. And it, it works pretty well. I've also tested corn oils, different kinds, flaxseed oil, fish oil, all these different oils they're trying to sell you for a nice, healthy-looking coat. Yeah, they make the coat shiny, but when you put your hand over it, they're they're kind of rough. They and they don't it, it doesn't sustain itself. In my experience, um, there was nothing that did as well as Missoula corn oil. It's not even other corn oils. It's not corn oil in general. Uh, Mazzola does not have the drying effect that these other oils do. Um, when I use the other oils, uh, the hair got dry just after a few hours. Uh, but Mazzola corn oil is quite remarkable, and it keeps the hair coat healthy, shiny, soft. It keeps the feet ideally lubricated and hard, and that's a big deal, too, because I've experienced a lot of people that are having uh, their animals' hooves, uh, particularly mules, um, but donkeys, too, and their feet appear to be getting too soft, and they start falling over and getting misshapen like uh, club feet. Mm. Uh, I've never had problems with my animal's feet with this corn oil added, one ounce of corn oil added to their grain mix in the evenings. Um, so their feet, uh, real healthy, no, no stress rings, no falling over, no club foot appearance. Heels are staying nice and, and supportive and all of that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing is that's probably the most important thing is that Missoula corn oil maintains the ideal conditioning of the digestive tract regularity. We have had absolutely no colics and certainly no founder since I went on this feeding program. Uh -huh. My vet misses us. <laughs> he, he even told me that. He says, I miss you guys when he comes twice a year for vaccinations and boosters. He goes, Are, is anybody sick? Uh, have they been sick? 
I said, no, if they'd been sick, I would have called you. If they were needed to be put down, I would have called you. If they needed a health check, I would have called you. But right. no, they're all doing fine. And my animals are between the ages of 29 and, and 33. So you would expect issues to come up, but sure. no way. Hmm. And they are just full of energy. They're moving you know, and good posture and everything, which they practice all the time since that's their normal way of going now, you know. So, and then I, uh, we, we got frustrated because we had a hard time finding grass hay. And I know that can be an issue, but we went ahead to raising our own broom and orchard grass mix and we, we harvested ourselves. And we feed that hay three times a day. If they need the mid midday feeding, we give it to them. Generally, when they're in turnout for the day, they won't need that third feeding. And we just uh, we monitor their weight with the hay, not with the, the oats mix. The oat mix uh, remains the same at one and a half cups of to two cups of oats, two cups probably in the winter, one and a half the rest of the year. We never feed broadleaf hays like alfalfa or clover, and we don't feed the grass hay fescue because it's uh, been known to cause abortions in pregnant mares, and if that's true, it's probably not the healthiest thing in the world to feed to any of them. Right. So I just stick with what works. We keep our animals in dry lots or stalls and runs. We limit their turnout to five hours a day to prevent obesity and other problems uh, like allergies, prolonged exposure to flies and other insects that live in the grassy pastures. Um, When you leave them out like that, their exposure is increased. And they don't get bored as long as, you know, you, they know they're going to go out. And the mules go out for five hours. The donkeys, on the other hand, donkeys can look at food and just explode. Right. So I don't, I don't turn my donkeys out at all. What we do is we have large dirt pens that we can turn them in in groups, and then they can play with each other. they got room to run and everything, and the fences are made so that they cannot chew on the fences. We've got vinyl fencing and with hot wires on them to keep them away from the fence, and you can do that with about any fence. But as long as they have enough room to run and play, uh, they don't care if they're eating or not because they know if you are consistent in your feeding program, they know they're going to get food. And these ones that are really, really obese like this, this will help them to drop weight. I might mention at this point, too, I did get any, uh, I saw a thing, um, a lady got a herd of really obese donkeys, and people are giving all kinds of advice on what to feed and how often and that stuff. But if, if And they say, oh, well, you're going to have to wean them off the feed that they're on. Uh, you know, so that they won't colic or or founder on mm-hmm. you. I when I got rock and roll, they were on uh, one of the highly marketed feeds. I dropped it immediately and put oh, them yeah. on my program, and there was no problem, no weaning them off it. If you're eating cookies and getting fat, do you think eating less cookies for a while is going to help? <laughs> Good or would point. it be just better to take it off that sugary icky food and go to something that's healthy that you know is not going to hurt them and and it didn't that was one of the tests of that whole thing with rock and roll they proved that my uh, management and training program works 100 percent and you don't have to, you know, you don't have to do all, jump through all these hoops that people think you have to jump through. They're, they're, they're just being fed all this propaganda to sell product. And you got you to gotta think about that, you know. Uh, these people out there that are selling these products don't really care if your animal is, you know, healthy or not. They know darn well you're not going to get into a lawsuit and spend a lot of money trying to fight with them. They know, we know that that's pointless really is you know you just right. do what you found mm-hmm. out to be healthy yeah so that's what i've done but that's also why i did all this research and i you know when people said have you tried this i tried it so i knew exactly what it was going to do and and the, i did uh 
equine senior quite extensively and just found out that that really didn't make all that big a difference with the older animals and if anything uh, because it was a dehydrated pellet it caused choking Uh, any of those dehydrated foods will do that because they suck the fluid out of the digestive tract Mm -hmm. and you can't add enough water to to make that healthy right people tell you you can but you really can't you know um there are no types of rewards or treats besides crimped oats or any other oat that's broken open steamed cracked etc that are healthy for these animals they cannot digest whole oats and other treats cause gas irregular irregularity to the digestive tract that can cause colic twists founder and even allergies and feeding things like sandwiches and peppermints and and all of these other things it may make you feel good but it doesn't necessarily make the animal feel good it will you know the oats you know are healthy sure. so go ahead and feed them yeah you know and you can feed as many or as few as you want but i've never had, had them overdose on oats you know they can eat those things all day long and that's what i use when i'm training and they love them they'll come off pasture for oats they'll knock themselves out for oats so you'll get what you want you'll get what you ask for um the other thing i've been told too is that worming with ivermectin every other month since january and then breaking it in november with strongid is overdoing the worming really and they say you need need to take fecal tests oh no well i i suppose you do if you see worms in the manure yeah but this ivermectin and they say that they build up an immunity to the ivermectin but ivermectin has been around for a long time number one it's been a very safe drug both for humans and animals right and uh i don't see any point in doing fecal tests when there's no worms in the manure yes if it stays in the larva stage and it gets killed every other month by ivermectin I don't think you need any more. And and the other thing that I've noticed is a lot of people's animals uh, just have flies all over the place. And even in our coolest, not really cold, but, but coolest and dampest weather when the flies just decide they're going to swarm, uh, my animals don't really attract flies. And I attribute that to the use of the ivermectin. It's it's supposed to take care of pests. Now a fly is a pest, and it that was validated when Sadie came back from uh, Hearts and Horses after working over at Hearts and Horses for 17 years. When she came back over here, she had not been on the ivermectin every other month. They do things differently over there. And she was standing in this herd with my other uh, eight mules, and the eight mules did not have fly swarms on them. But she, her legs were covered with flies, mm. and they were a solid band right underneath her her belly. And after going on the, the ivermectin for two months, just two months, and then being sprayed with uh, Farnham TriTech. 14 once a week during grooming twice a week this last year because they were pretty thick but she all of a sudden did not have those swarms of flies on her anymore after going on to my program they disappeared and they just came in you know they were pesky but there weren't just swarms of them and covering her legs and stuff and you know people try to uh take care of that sort of thing with you know leg wraps and fly blankets and everything that flatten their hair and makes the hair coat dysfunctional right (laughs) um so it can't do its job i think that mother nature did just fine in the beginning and god did when he made them so we got to keep things as natural as possible and when you do and you just do things that that work 
And like I said, ivermectin is a really mild drug, and it seems to be doing its job. And in 40 years, I have not had any larva or worms showing up in the manure at all. Not at all. So, yeah, I'm going to stick to my program of doing that every other month because I do believe that it aids in repelling flies when, you know, they're present in the spring, summer, and fall. The other uh, thing that I've noticed is that animals that are on other feeding programs have a completely different body shape. They've got the protruding spine across the top with a hay belly hanging from it. Uh, Their shape is different from a balanced body with core strength. And the core strength is developed with leading exercises in my hourglass pattern. It only takes 15 minutes once a week to develop this. It's not like, you know, people will tell me, oh, I don't have time for that. Well, you you do have 15 minutes a week for each animal. And if you've got multiple animals, you can always just tie the others along on the side and take each one through the hourglass pattern with all the halts in it and everything that you do to develop this and it still won't take that long you know you can you can 15 minutes per animal once a week it's easy i got kind of overwhelmed when i was doing uh, rock and roll and thought i had to do it more often and that's when i uh noticed i i got tired and i didn't want to do it every other day so I just thought, well, let's just see what happens if I do it every other every other week. Ah. And, you know, it had the same effect on them. They learned how to walk in good posture by themselves. And pretty soon after doing it for a few months, I noticed that the animals themselves were going out and practicing their good posture during turnout. And so they were actually learning how they needed to walk to make themselves feel good and with those guys they had ring bone they had side bones rock had a shattered hip so they would notice when i taught them how to walk the right way and how much better it felt so it doesn't surprise me at all that they went ahead and started doing it themselves Mm -hmm. i had a, a brood mare that did the same thing she had an extraordinary uh, case of um, swayback and I started doing some work with her and she had a hard time walking straight so after I showed her this then she would do her exercises walking along the fence to help keep her straight because she couldn't do it by herself but she sure as heck got the point Mm. I think that's quite remarkable these animals are a lot smarter than we think they are you know now In all of this, you know, having the body, you know, uh, developed so that it's optimum for them, uh, it's important that the saddle fits them and you have a better chance of it fitting them if they are in good good physical shape oh, yeah. than if they're not. You you can try all day long to find a saddle that will fit your mule, but if you don't get their body in optimum shape, you're going to be chasing that thing for a long time and never find the, something that fits. Sure. And my saddles, like I've said before, will fit all of my mules and donkeys. Now, granted... You know, I have one donkey that is very flat withered, Wrangler, and and the saddle. If you try to put your weight on that saddle, and don't, you know, don't use your own body correctly, that it, you know, once you're on and everything, if you put too much weight in one stirrup or the other, it's going to slide over to the side. It just will, you know. But it helps if you have a saddle that not only fits the animal, and the saddles fit him. He's just slippery and he's round, you know. <laughs> but he's a slippery but you have, kind of a guy. <laughs> yeah, he kind of is, you know. But see, you have to take into consideration if your saddle is built right, and it it will, you know, it will fit your animal optimally so that when he's in good posture, he has the ability to travel more smoothly. And when the pack and equipment is stabilized on the animal, um, then you have a 
better opportunity to practice your riding ability and learn how to ride a balanced seat. This is super important that you have equal weight in both your feet, especially on a donkey like him, Mm, you know, because then you could actually ride that, throw that saddle up there and not even attach the girths and it will stay on. If you're balanced and if that saddle fits your animal, you can stay balanced over an unhitched saddle Mm, as long as the animal is able able to move freely Mm -hmm. and correctly with equal weight over all four feet, you know, a nice roundness in his spine and everything. Um, And then he will be able to use every single joint in his body correctly. And that avoids things like, you know, side bones and ring bone and arthritis in the joints and all of that kind of stuff. And so uh, I think I've I've mentioned that I did find a saddle maker. Uh, I noticed when I jumped on my horse's bareback, I had a groove right behind the shoulder blades where my, my legs would fall. And it was it felt pretty stable, but when I got on my mule's bareback, there was a muscle there that just felt like it was constantly pushing me out of balance. I thought, well, this must be the real difference between horses and mules, um, because the only thing that was different was that groove. My saddles fit both my horses and my mules until I had my saddle maker shave the tree right there in the gullet and shave it flat to accommodate that muscle on the mules. Then my saddles didn't fit my horses so well, but it fit, you know, it fit my mules and it fit all of them. And so in order to balance, you know, yourself and your saddle, it not only needs to fit your equine, but it needs to fit your body as well. The saddle needs to sit level across the back so you can sit up straight in a balanced position with the only deep contour directly below your seat bones. Now you will see a lot of saddles with a lot of different contours on them. And I've sat in a lot of them and a lot of them right up there by, you know, really close to the top of your thigh, they've got some kind of swell in the saddle that they think is just great. And all it does is rub and put a bruise behind your femur. If you can't sit up straight with your legs resting below your core, which is located directly behind your belly button, um, it's it's not going to allow you that balanced seat. You need to be able to relax your legs and gently hug your equine on both sides with your whole body perpendicular to the ground when halted. This way, cues from your legs will not be abrupt. Right. They won't come out of nowhere to startle the equine when you just press harder when you want to push them, you know, either one way or the other. And saddles that aren't that restrict your position are not really a help to balance your seat and make cues effective either. You know, uh, there are Australian saddles that have those swells in front of your leg to help keep you in the saddle. They they even have, you know, swells on other Western saddles that kind of keep you, you know, set in the seat. Uh, But that's not really to your advantage. You need to be able to hug your equine and stay in that upright position. And then when they start to move, your legs need to follow uh, the movement of your equine. And you can't do that when you're restricted by things in, you know, in the saddle. Your stirrups need to hang straight down over the center of balance of the equine. That doesn't mean they stay there. They should be able to freely swing with the motion of the animal. That way your legs that are hugging can swing across your animal's body. And and you can still be touching them, but you know, your legs aren't rigidly held in a position. Uh, stirrups with top of arrows, uh, they say, oh yeah, that's safer. Well, I just did a, uh, a film shoot in which I had to wear some old-fashioned lace-up boots that had pointy toes. And when I put them in my saddle that had the tapaderos, 
uh, those pointy toes would not let me get the ball of my foot right over the stirrup. Ah. And, and, and so every time the animal moved, my foot fell out of the stirrup. Oh. So, you know, you need to wear boots that are, don't have those fashionable long pointy toes. If you're going to have tapaderos on your saddle, you need to be able to get the ball of your foot into the stirrup. Okay. And you should never you should never wear tennis shoes or shoes with no heels right. because then your your foot can slip through the stirrup. That's the obvious thing. But ideally your weight should be on the ball of your foot with the heel of your boot touching the back of the stirrup to keep it from sliding through the stirrups. And so it's not only just the stirrups, it's what you're wearing on your feet. Your saddle should not just be perched on top. When you get on, you should be able to easily find that place for your seat bones over the center of gravity, which is the only contour that the saddle ought to have. Everything else on the saddle ought to be pretty smooth. It it can, you know, it can kind of have a slope backwards into that contour, you know, where your seat's going to go. And that's fine, but I see a lot of saddles that are made these days uh, with too many contours uh, and with insufficient body condition in your equine, uh, it puts pressure that can cause chafing on both sides of the animal instead of uh, spreading the pressure points over a wider area underneath the saddle. Uh, the gullets tend to be too high. The, the horn is sitting up on top. It looks like these saddles are perched on top of these animals. Right. And yeah. this, the, the saddle should fit such that it's stabilized on the animal when all the girths and straps are secure. When they are, it will move with the animal without excess movement. It will just move right along with them. You know, it just fits like a glove, and that's what you want. Uh, the most obvious uh, example of pressure on both sides, and a lot of people think changing the tree uh, is going to do this, um, not necessarily. It is the tree, but it's not the shape of the tree necessarily. It's just getting rid of that concave uh, thing that's on the, on, in the gullet uh, on the bottom of the tree where horses have that indentation and uh, mules do not. When you shave that and it goes away, any tree that's made for a horse uh, will probably fit your mule. So you, instead of going out looking for a new saddle, you can ask your, your saddle maker, find a good saddle maker that might shave that flat in the gullet there for you and see if your saddle doesn't fit your mule then because it probably will. And then if you do that, then the saddle sits lower at the gullet onto your animal and has a nice snug snugness about it all the way across his back. And for that right reason, you don't necessarily want to use stiff uh, pads. They think that these work really well. Well, I guess they do on pack animals, but uh, right. <laughs> I don't think that thick pads are necessarily the answer because it just allows the saddle to be perched on the animal instead of really fitting the animal and moving with the animal, which makes you trying to struggle with your balanced seat a whole lot harder. Um, the other thing that is a concern to me is my saddles <clears throat> all have saddle horns that are set pretty low and, and shaving that gullet set the saddle even lower on the back of the animal and made it fit like a glove. And that works really well. I've noticed that a lot of these other saddles have horns that stick way up. And they're narrow. They couldn't be. They they couldn't be dallied on because if the if you stop and the steer's pressure is put on them, they probably just break. Right. They probably just snap. Yeah. You know. And and I noticed I've got a, a 1867 uh, California style Western saddle that is shaped after the saddles that the vaqueros used, and the saddle horn on that is very thick and round. And those guys had to deal with roping, you know, steers, roping horses, roping everything. And um, 
So that just seemed a whole lot more sensible to me. And that saddle was built on a McClellan uh, tree. And the McClellan saddles had that that open area all the way from the gullet to the kennel. And uh, the other thing, this guy built this saddle for himself. And before he died of cancer, he agreed to sell it to me because I needed a saddle for men. It's a 16 inch and all I had was 15 and a half. So the guys that were riding in my saddles were kind of crunched. And these same guys that were riding in my saddles uh, told me that they didn't like to ride a balanced seat because it crushed their genitals. <laughs> and that, wow. made me start, <laughs> that made me start thinking about this McClellan design and how the cavalry, which were all men, rode in these, these kinds of things. And I thought, you know, I bet you that gap gives them some relief. Yeah. And I've never had anybody say that. But I've heard a lot of them complaining about riding a balance seat because they say it hurts there when they do it. Oh, boy. So, so, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, it's just, it's a consideration, you know, definitely. And I, I take these things to heart. I also know I have a girlfriend that was riding your typical western saddle that looked like it was perched on her horses with a very high horn and everything and uh i I saw a perfect example on the internet of what happens when your animal is not comfortable and when they don't have core strength this horse this guy was riding this horse around along a gully and they came to a place where there was a rise in the ground and this horse was not really paying too much attention. He was kind of a lazy horse. And they aren't lazy when they got core strength, and they do pay attention. But this horse ran his chest right into this this rise in the ground. And then when he did, he was like, oh, i got to climb up this. And he tried to climb up it and ended up on his knees uh-huh. and, and gave a jolt. And the rider went up onto his neck. And then when he tried to hoist himself up over this hump in the, in the trail, then there was another abrupt motion. And the rider, who was now hanging on the neck, got tossed in, into a tree branch that was hanging over the trail because the horse, of course, went underneath it. And and then when he got to the other side of the branch, he managed to get himself back over the, the horn and back into the saddle again. But then some guys that were ahead of him on the trail were there to catch the horse, and the horse uh, just shied away from the guys that were trying to catch him, and the guy went over the side of the saddle and landed on the ground. I don't think that, you know, if you've got an animal with strong core strength and confidence in the way he moves, uh, who is very attentive to where he places his feet and everything, would ever get caught in, the, in, a, in a situation like that. Right, right. Uh, my girl, uh, you know, it, it just wouldn't happen. Um, my girlfriend had the same kind of thing happen to her, and her horse did an abrupt jump. She went up. But it wasn't one that slung her on the neck. She came down right on the saddle horn and ended up in the hospital and had to have surgery uh, to fix that injured area. It rendered her sterile, uh, and she still has pain in that area even today. Mm -hmm. And that happened like 15 years ago. Oh, my. So... Saddle horns are an important consideration, and I firmly believe that these these trail cl- uh, classes that they have when they put a jump in there is is really not safe. It's dangerous, and when people are trying to make things more difficult for shows and everything, and they do this in the combined training uh, industry too. Uh, they make jumps to trap animals to really, oh, yeah. you know, make 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 it different and harder and everything. And their their mind is on everything but safety. And so they design these courses for trail, for you know, cross country and things like that. And they put jumps in there, just not safe for the riders or for the animals. And I think that you can you can have fair and equitable competition without doing that. Right. I, right. I think it's 
better to use good sense and just just make things fair, you know, and not put riders and animals at risk that way. Sure. Well, Meredith, you've been really generous with your time and, and you've given us so much thought. And I want to thank you for coming back on. And of course, you have a website. Yes, I do. My website is at www.lucky3ranch.com. And if you look under training, there's a lot of free information under there about all the stuff we're talking about. And if you have any more questions about details, you're welcome to email me at Meredith, M-E-R-E-D-I-T-H, at Lucky3Ranch.com. I have a Facebook page at Meredith Hodges, public figure, where a lot of these things are posted as well. Or if you just want to talk, I do answer the phone. Please leave a message if you don't get me straight up, because I do answer everyone that communicates with me. My phone number is 800-816-7566. Awesome. And you also have a children's website. Tell me about yes, that. Yes, we, we do have a children's website, and we've got all kinds of information and games for kids, uh, as well as music videos and coloring pages at jasperthemule.com. Awesome. All right. Thanks again, Meredith, and we will talk soon. Sounds perfect. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or a sponsor, send me an email. Everycowgirlsdream at gmail.com. Gotta go. My mule is looking for me. Meal Talk is an Every Cowgirl's Dream production.